Thanks a while. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's debate, the semi-final debate. My name is Sami Khalidi, and I am the chairman of this debate. The timekeeper is Isaac Harris. The debate will be judged by a panel of three adjudicators, who are Miss France, Miss Lowen, and Mr. Hume. The topic for this debate is that we should inoculate people against depression and trauma. The affirmative team seated to my right is from Bananga International High School, and the negative team seated to my left is from Emmanuel College. The speaking time for this debate is six minutes. A single warning bell will sound one minute before the speaking time, and a double bell will sound at the speaking time. Please ensure that your mobile phones are switched off. I declare this debate open and call upon the first affirmative speaker, Yun Kai. Good evening, Mr. and Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of tonight's debate is that we should inoculate people against depression and trauma. We, the affirmative team, define inoculate as an act of treating with a vaccine with the intention of developing immunity. Against as a protection or defense from bad effects of depression being a mental health disorder characterized by a persistently depressed mood or lost in interest in activities, causing significant impairment in daily life, and trauma being an emotional response to traumatic event. Tonight, we the affirmative team believe that this statement is irrefutably true. And as first speaker, I'll be addressing two substantive points how inoculation against depression and trauma strengthens the body's resilience and prevents future resurgences, prioritizing prevention over cure. My second point will address how inoculation against depression and trauma can also result in additional health benefits such as increased productivity, improved moods, and reduction in anxiety. Our second speaker, Jaden, will be speaking on how inoculating people against depression and trauma will significantly reduce the number of suicides and deaths relating to how relating to such and how it enables people to enjoy a more fulfilling life. He will also highlight the major economic advantage of inoculating people against depression and, depression and trauma. Our third speaker, Ashraf, will then address the flaws present in the negative team's arguments before summarising our team's case. Now on to my first point. Depression and trauma are shown to have a profound impact on individual health, family and social relationships. These negative effects often extend to healthcare providers, payers, and employers, impacting the greater community. Typically, care for depression consists of either a combination of prescribed antidepressants and psychotherapy. These methods are proven to be ineffective for many as the causes of depression are often over overlooked and oversimplified, leading to generalized prescriptions which do not take into account the individual needs and the drugs taken often do not resolve the root of the issue. Most animal models used by scientists to test antidepressants depressants, are based on the hypothesis that, depress that stress causes depression. Scientists artificially induce stress to analyze the behavior of animals and manipulate these behaviors with drugs and state that there will be effective antidepressants. This presents a massive flaw in the, in the experimental process. Scientists are not treating depression, they're treating stress. Oftentimes, a new episode of trauma or depression will render medication completely obsolete. It is common for depression and, tra and trauma symptoms to worsen despite treatment due to uncontrollable factors. Stim stimulants and antidepressants induce highly rewarding emotions. This can result in a growing dependence on the substance to produce a rewarding emotion in the short term. However, they may have long-term consequences on health and well-being. By inoculating against depression and trauma, we are actively, actively preventing such issues from arising in the first place, focusing on keep, keeping people healthy and not just treating them when they are ill. This means giving people the knowledge, confidence, and means to support themselves and manage their health more effectively. My second point. There are many contributing benefits to inoculating against depression and trauma. Not only is it protective against physical illness and linked to a greater productivity, but the mental well-being of a population, as it is essential for the country's sustainability, long-term growth and development. Numerous additional health benefits will be derived as a result of inoculating people against depression and trauma. An example of this is reduced procrastination. 
Procrastination is a habit of avoiding tasks to focus on less important, more enjoyable and simpler tasks despite neg negative consequences. Procrastination is associated with a variety of dangers and negative effects, including, but not limited to, a worsening academic performance, financial status, increased interpersonal relationship issues, and reduced well-being. An inoculation against depression and trauma will be of great benefit in terms of helping overcome procrastination. This is because procrastination, depression, and trauma stem from the same root cause, stress. According to Dr. Rebecca Bracham, what makes someone resilient isn't their ability to experience stress, at all. It isn't their ability to not experience stress at all, but how quickly their nervous system bounces back from stressful episodes and the alexogen they have developed enhances stress resilience. So, Mr. and Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot continue to invest in the same services and models of the past to treat trauma and depression. We, the affirmative team, envision a greater future where prevention is prioritized over cure. With an aging society and the increasingly complex living conditions, it is imperative that we move on to new methods of to treating depression and trauma, to keep people healthy, living in the community and out of hospitals. Thank you. Call upon the first negative speaker, Olivia Bruni. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, respected chairperson. The topic of tonight's debate is that we should inoculate people against depression and trauma. We, as a negative team, believe this is undoubtedly false. As the first speaker, I will explain there are an array of different alternatives that alternative solutions that address the same issue, and that the drug has the potential for overdependence. Our second speaker will talk to you about the, the scientific impact on the human form and the impracticality of such inoculation. And finally, our third speaker will rebut and summarize our team case, which is that there are better preventative measures than inoculation. However, before I begin my speech, I would like to state that as the negative team, we agree with the definition provided. However, we would like to make some amendments. The first being is how the opposition has defined inoculate against. They have described it as a vaccine. Though, though we believe that such should be defined as to provide the preventative treatment as an electrogen resistant enhancer, we just like to expand upon what exactly the drug is or what inoculation is in this context, which is an electrogen resistance enhancer in order to prevent depression or other symptoms of high stress. Due to the use of should in this topic, it can be understood that this inoculation is not forceful and thus should just be optionally provided to people. Furthermore, we believe that this inoculation takes the form of electrogen resistance enhancers, those mentioned in Rebecca Branchman's TED Talk. As such are the, currently the only types of medical inoculation for mental illness with any sort of research or scientific support. These resistance enhancers falling under the medical banner of alexogens have been described to be formed from prophylactic ketamine by Branchman herself in her NCBI study about such and medcast.com article and are designed to strengthen neurons resistance to stress. As stated in Branchman's NCBI study, it is declared that these electrogens only last up for four weeks and thus medication is to be taken on a somewhat regular basis. Thus, it would not be a one-time injection. They also did not define people. So I would like to add an amendment up to how we define people. We believe that people should be defined as everybody who consents to the receival of such drug 
due to the way in which if this drug becomes mainstream should become available in some form to all people and thus it is important to recognize that anybody that can be inoculated not just a certain group of people and finally to finish our amendments the opposition have defined depression and trauma as a, a continuous state of low mood and um, a stressful event but we believe that should that such should be instead defined as stress-induced mental conditions such as clinical depression, PTSD, and other forms of trauma due to the way in which alexogens that are the focus of this debate specifically focus upon enhancing stress resilience and hence their main purpose is to inoculate against stress-induced mental conditions, not just generally mental illness. I would now like to begin my first point after that lengthy amendment, <laughs> which is that there are better resources in the world to prevent and treat depression and trauma. One alternative to inoculation is cognitive behavioral therapy, otherwise known as CBT, which according to research by both Stanford and collaborative research between the John Hopson School of Public Health, Oxford University, and University of London is proven more effective than any medication used currently to, tr to treat and prevent depression. CBT is a more sustainable treatment due to the fact that it focuses on restructuring disordered thinking, um, building lifelong tools to regulate emotions, and establishing a healthy lifestyle, which helps patients process stressful or traumatic events healthily without developing mental illness while through the process of well processing. Another solution to stress-induced conditions exists within prevention education programs. These programs work with all demographics in building effective ways to prevent stress-induced mental illness, destigmatizing it, and educating. The World Health Organization has stated that prevention programs have been shown to reduce depression. While this may not seem like much, Reshaping our minds and habits through CBT and working towards a more educated world will undoubtedly be just as effective, if not more, than inoculation. The researchers behind uh, Alexigens found that these alternative solutions in managing depression and, dep depression and trauma have much validity, as the Washington Post reported that Dr. Rebecca Branchman, the head researcher, stating this, exercise has been shown to be almost as robust in the drugs and managing the mental health exercise, which is incorporated in part of the CBT treatment. I would now like to discuss my second point, which in the nature of this drug is inherently harmful because of its easily reliant nature. As example, once somebody begins taking antidepressants, it's extremely difficult to stop taking them because the mind becomes on the, reliant on the drug to assist in chemical production. U.S. News found that 56% of people relapse into depression after stopping antidepressants since the brain no longer knows how to create and manage chemicals without the drug support. Alexogens would not be so much different. When taking any drug, which is managing internal processes for the body, the body undoubtedly becomes reliant on the drug, in this case, alexogens, as they are doing the heavy lifting of the chemical process which makes it extremely challenging for the patient, especially once the drug has been stopped, to produce their own chemical and lifestyle in order to feel okay. Further research done by North Point Washington found that it could take only a matter of days and weeks before tolerance begins to form. This applies even when the drug is taken on a daily basis. This is even more dangerous when you consider that production and distribution of a drug will never be guaranteed as there's drug shortages all the time, such as the more such as the most recent COVID vaccine shortages.
I call upon the second affirmative speaker, Jaden Atijatu. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for debate is that we should inoculate people against depression and trauma. As the affirmative team for tonight's debate, we unquestionably believe that this statement is true, arguing that we should inoculate people against depression and trauma. I would first like to rebut some of the points addressed by the first speaker of the negative team. The first speaker of the negative team has tried to tell you in uh, her first point that there are different solutions, with one of them being cognitive therapy. The government is already spending money on mental health services, such as cognitive therapy, and inoculating people will be another way to help the economy and less money being spent on mental health services. Not everyone is privileged enough to get access to these solutions or programs. So how do you suggest to supply these services to everyone? This is why we believe that we should inoculate people against depression and trauma. Our first speaker, Yun, talked about how we should inoculate people against depression and trauma as it will prevent them from re reoccurring again. She also talked about the health benefits of inoculating, inoculating people with the example of procrastination. Today, as second speaker, I will be discussing two points. I will discuss how inoculating people against depression and trauma <coughs> will benefit the economy by reducing the amount being spent on treating depression and trauma, as well as additional individual costs involved. I will also discuss how it will allow the people to live better lifestyles, as well as save lives, as it is the leading cause of suicide. Our third speaker, Ashraf, will rebut in some of our case. According to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, the Australian government spent $3.8 billion out of the $11 billion budget on mental health related services between 2019 and 2020. Some mental health treatment services include individual psychotherapy or individual counselling, group therapy, medical supervision, recreational therapies and complementary therapies such as yoga or meditation. However, the largest proportion of money being spent was for ambulatory visits at 42%. With a preventative treatment that was discovered, it would be able to lower the number of people needing them, meaning there wouldn't need to be as much money as there is now needing to be spent on these visits due to mental illnesses. It will also result in reducing pressure on the health system during the COVID-19 pandemic. Following ambulatory visits, Medication or prescription drugs was the second largest proportion at 30%. As Dr. Rebecca Brockman discovered in her experiments with mice, antidepressants created no benefit in the stress behavior of mice and the stress levels didn't decrease. However, the drug, which she calls the re resilience enhancer, completely prevents the depressive behavior of the mice and the mice appear to be happy and social. Therefore, through Dr. Brockman's discoveries from the experiments run, we shouldn't be spending money on funding for medications such as antidepressants, but we should instead be spending it on tests, figuring out if the resilience enhancer works on humans and then producing more of it. With this in mind, the inoculation of people against depression and trauma, less money will be needed to spend on mental health services, such as ambulatory visits and medication, which in turn could be spent on other sectors with not enough financial support, such as the health sector. This is why we undoubtedly believe that we should inoculate people against depression and trauma. Some symptoms that people with depression can go through include feelings of sadness or emptiness, loss of, enjo loss of en enjoyment in previously enjoyed activities, too much or too little amounts of sleep, low energy or fatigue, and intrusive thoughts of death and suicide. As Beyond Blue, a mental health and well-being organisation states, around 1.16 million Australians have experienced depression or trauma in the past 12 months, as well as over 280 million people globally su suffering from depression, according to the World Health Organisation. With the research performed by scientists and Dr. Brockman's discovery of a preventative treatment that will help the victim recover from stress and build resilience, leading to them not experiencing depression and trauma. Some of these symptoms, if not all, will not have to occur with the people living with these conditions anymore, allowing them to live a more healthier lifestyle. Dr. Brockman and her team's drug, aka the Resilience Enhancer, 
is designed so that it will help the survive, sufferer recover from stressful times and build resilience against symptoms of depression. This drug will also save lives as a penultimate reason for suicide is trauma or mental illness. As the World Health Organization also mentions, over 700,000 people die due to suicide every year, with suicide being the fourth leading cause of death in 15 to 29 year olds. So, not only will it allow the person to live a healthy lifestyle, both physically and mentally, but it will also allow lives to be saved from suicide caused by depression, trauma, or any other mental disorders. This is why, as the affirmative team for tonight's debate, we indisputably believe that we should inoculate people against depression and trauma. So, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, we fully believe the statement that we should inoculate people against depression and trauma as it will benefit the economy in a massive way, with less money being needed to spend on mental health services, and it will also allow previous sufferers to live a healthier and also safer lifestyle, which could result in fewer lives being lost from suicide. As an unknown author once quoted, having a healthy mind is just as important as having a healthy body. So, why not inoculating against depression and trauma be the first step for more people to have a healthy mind and a healthy life? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I call upon the second negative speaker, Jamie Reichelt. Good evening, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of tonight's debate is that we should inoculate people against depression and trauma. We, the negative team, believe this is undoubtedly false. I'd like to begin by rebutting some of the opposition's case. The first affirmative speaker has explained that the inoculation of people against depression and trauma helps build resilience. We, the negative team, fundamentally disagree with this premise. While these drugs can provide some sort of band-aid solution when it comes to preventing stress and trauma, we believe, as mentioned by our first negative speaker, there are countless other alternative solutions that actually provide long-term and more fundamentally helpful resistance. If, if a drug is lost, if we lose access to this drug in one case, what would happen to people who fundamentally rely on this drug to have their resilience and prevent depression and trauma. Rather than relying on this drug, we should focus more on developing sustainable and long-term strategies to help support people. The first affirmative speaker also mentions that increases efficiency, especially in the form of procrastination. Procrastination, as they mentioned, occurs mainly because of stress. While the drug can, the drug doesn't, this is the thing, the drug doesn't necessarily stop the stress from happening. It does allow them to recover faster, but it is again just another band-aid solution. Because again, if they lose access to this drug, then how are they going to recover from situations and still have this increased efficiency? And it doesn't address the actual issue. There are many stresses in our society. Rather than trying to cover them up or band-aid them with this drug, maybe we should actually address why it's so much youth, why so many workers are so stressed and so depressed across our society. The second affirmative speaker then went on to also explain about how it reduces pressure on health systems and helps support hospitals. As I'll explain in my first and second points, the use of this drug doesn't necessarily have the biggest health impact upon people. 
The research into this drug is still very little. There have been no long-term studies conducted on this drug so, drug, so we have little to no knowledge of how this will affect people in the long term. So the, the, while it does have the benefit of reducing stress, we need to acknowledge that this could also have major negative health implications across our society. And this same logic applies to the second affirmative point about how it saves lives and support people. Again, we don't have enough knowledge to confirm this. Now onto my points. Our first speaker has already explained that there is an array of alternate solutions that can address the same issue, and that this drug has the potential for overdependence. Today, I will be talking to you about the scientific impact on the human form and the impractical use of these drugs. My first point is that the inoculation of people could potentially be harmful upon the human form. While these drugs have many benefits, it still provides a, presents a wide array of potentially negative effects. In a study conducted by Adriana Fida that focuses on ketamine efficacy against PTSD found that the most common side effects were blurred vision, dry mouth, restlessness, fatigue, nausea, poor coordination, and headaches. These findings undeniably show that there is some lack of understanding when it comes to the use of ketamine or these resilience enhancers. This is again reinforced by a study by Alicia Mestrodonato and Dr. Rebecca Bruckman, the creator of this drug herself, which states, brain circuits underlying ketamine-induced stress resilience are still largely unknown. Furthermore, there is little known about the long-term effects of this drug, as no long-term trials are yet to be conducted. In addition to this, some more recent studies have found that ketamine as a prophylactic is inconsistent based upon the sex of a recipient. A study conducted by Tracy O'Kine found that ketamine prevented chronic stress-induced changes in male, but did not protect females against the effects of chronic stress. Again, there are inconsistencies in the effects of this drug. Clearly, this medication does not have enough scientific grounding to a point in which we should be inoculating people using it. As mentioned by our first negative speaker, there are countless other alternatives that have the science and have the research and the backing to be implemented into our society. My second point is that the use of this magic medication may be impractical and wasteful for society. According to Medcast.com, only 10% of traumatic experiences in Australia fall into a category in which the event is expected, such as soldiers, ambulance workers and aid workers. However, domestic abuse, road accidents and harassment and more account for the other 90% of PTSD. For a drug like this to effectively work and account for the 90% of unexpected traumatic experiences, it would have to be administrated prior to the traumatic event. Prior to these events, how can we know when these other 90% of events are going to occur? Of course, we could argue that we could simply administer the drug to everyone at all times and at any risk of a potential traumatic event, such as simply getting in the car in the morning. However, this would be extremely impractical and have a huge cost for society. Imagine the cost to make this drug and administer it to every single person at risk of a traumatic event. Fundamentally, this drug cannot effectively address stress-induced trauma across society. It can only address the small 10% of expected trauma. As mentioned by our first negative speaker, there is a broad range of other treatments that are almost as effective. Rather than investing into a drug that can only serve 10% of PTSD cases, it would be more practical to invest in these alternate solutions that can serve almost everyone in society, helping to actually address the full 100% of PTSD cases. In conclusion, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, we should not inoculate people against depression and trauma, as it has a potential impact upon the human form, and that it does not effectively address depression and trauma across society. While the goal to prevent trauma and depression is good, we believe there are far better solutions and methods to prevent such disorders. We want a better future of mental health, but this future must be invested in correctly, in the correct solutions, helping us all in a sustainable, practical and effective manner. Thank you.
I call upon the third affirmative speaker, Ashraf Ali. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for this debate is that we should inoculate people against depression and trauma. We, the affirmative team, know that this statement is true and that we should supply inoculations to everyone for the sake of the I will first rebut some of the opposition's points. As part of the first speaker's first point, they said that alternatives, such as CBT, are more proven to work. We are not saying that this alexogen will work 100% of the time. Just like cognitive behavioral therapy, it won't work 100% of the time either, but it should at least be an option to society. As part of the first speaker's first point and the second speaker's rebuttal, they said that alternatives exist. And um, it does not take away the option of inoculation though, as stated in the definition, making this point completely meaningless. As a part of the first speaker's second point about addiction, Alexigent forms a stress resilient and not a particular emotion. Therefore, it's strange to say that there will be addiction to this. According to the second speaker, um, they said that the drug has not been developed enough. And they are basing most of their point on what we know today. The drug is still being developed. And the entire argument was based off the drug as of now. It's not practical to be speaking of a drug that's still being developed. Our first speaker, Yun, spoke about how inoculation against depression can help strengthen the body and prevent it from coming again in the future. She talked about how depression medication only treats stress and not the actual depression, and how during testing they induce stress and treat it with medication. Depression medication don't, usually doesn't work, and treating it is very difficult or sometimes impossible. Inoculating can prevent the problem in the first place before it even has an impact. She also talked about how inoculation against depression can help people by increasing productivity, improving their moods, helping them create healthier relationships, and reducing anxiety. If we had properly working medication that is reliable, people would have depression for a short period of time before they got treated. And this can still affect a person and people close to them permanently. Our second speaker, Jaden, spoke to you about how too much money has been spent on treating mental health and inoculating people can help save money and people's time. Similar to vaccines, they can help people from going to the hospital and spending a lot of money on treatment for something that can be easily avoided. He also spoke to you about how inoculating people against depression and trauma enables people to enjoy a more fulfilling life. He spoke about how all the symptoms of depression and how much it can affect someone. Even people experiencing trauma and depression go through painful symptoms, which can greatly hinder day-to-day -day life. It's the leading cause of disability worldwide, according to World Health Organization. And by inoculating people against such negative effects, more than half a million lives lost each year to suicide can be saved. So, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it isn't even a decision to make, as we must inoculate people so that they can avoid depression and trauma. As Elizabeth, Elizabeth Wurzel said, people think depression is sadness, that it's crying and dressing in black. But those people are wrong. Depression is the constant feeling of being numb. It's being numb to emotions, being numb to life. You wake up in the morning and wish you never did. Thank you.
I call upon the third negative speaker, Edward Micken. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for tonight is that we should inoculate people against oppression and trauma, and we, as the negative team, believe that there are better preventative methods for such conditions than inoculation. As third speaker, I will rebut the affirmative team and summarise my team's case. But first off, my rebuttal. The opponent's arguments have fallen under two main themes, and I will cover both of these themes in depth. The first unifying theme that underlines the opponent's case is that of the quality of individual lives. A crucial part of the human experience is feelings. In particular, stress, a feeling which helps develop resilience. Stress, a feeling which promotes the creation of techniques and strategies to overcome challenges right in front of you. This alexogen proposed as inoculation for depression and trauma helps strengthen one's resilience to stress. However, such does it through unnatural and unsustainable ways. As mentioned by the first negative speaker, through use of this drug to increase resilience, people all across the world who use this inoculation will be prevented from developing methods to deal with stress, prevented from sustainably facing challenges. Instead, they will be fueled with an over-reliance on this drug, unable to face stress without it, and thus unable to function. Use of this drug will lead to dependence. This sort of dependence can be clearly seen within alcohol abuse, with one in six Australians, according to Health Direct, drinking at an incredibly risky level, all due to an over-reliance on alcohol. And now, whilst you may think that despite this over-reliance, this drug should just be taken for a lifetime to, re to prevent the need for resilience, you are mistaken. As described by the second negative speaker, research into this drug has displayed signs of ketamine, a highly powerful disassociative which severely impedes cognitive and biological function, with ketamine causing blurred vision, dry mouth, restlessness, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, poor coordination and headaches, as well as bladder damage in the long term, according to the ADF. Furthermore, little research so far has been conducted into prophylactic ketamine and thus may provide further negative cognitive effects. Such lack of understanding, as described by the second negative speaker, may potentially lead to further harm in the recipients of this drug. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, there are better alternatives to aiding stress in these drugs than these drugs. The second theme which underlies the opposition's case is that of quality of society. Now, whilst we accept that this drug may aid reduction of stress at an individual level, such as incredibly disadvantageous for society as a whole. Firstly, as stated by the first negative speaker, these drugs for a fabricated resilience within the world, a resilience which does not address the underlying problems within society, nor attempts to deal with such in a sustainable way, instead just providing a ploy of nirvana. According to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, over 75% of Australians have experienced a traumatic experience in their lives, with trauma mostly stemming from conflict. Yet instead of addressing the societal causes of distress and trauma, this drug just attempts to decrease their effects, meaning the same horrific, traumatic and stressful events will keep festering within our world without change, just a fabricated resilience. Furthermore, as stated by the second negative speaker, the use of this drug is an incredible waste of resources. Bringing alexogens into the mainstream without proper research, consideration or development may severely impede the welfare system of the globe, causing great money to be spent and great resources to be devoted to a drug that may possibly, in the end, not even work. A drug which is only practical to 10% of PTSD cases as described by the second negative speaker, and thus will be impractical to large parts of the population. Now, I admit that I could be offering, accused of offering a Nirvana fallacy, but would it not be more valuable for society for this money to be spent on research, or the development of better, more effective and less destructive methods of preventing trauma, as mentioned by the first negative speaker? Money which could extend over the range of 20 billion dollars as displayed by the cost of the Moderna vaccine. Finally, the development and mainstreaming of this drug 
that which produces over-reliance and a dependence would further extend the powerful power of large pharmaceutical companies, <coughs> establishing them with further power of the global markets, alike to their rise within the recent opioid crisis, in which companies like Big Purdue Pharma profited over $3 billion. And thus, this drug would not benefit society, just casting a curtain over the damage such would cause, which further displays the reasons why we must consider other alternatives to these alexogens. In summary, the negative team has provided you, ladies and gentlemen, with a clear case against the inoculation of people against depression and trauma. Our case has revolved around the team line that there are better preventative methods than inoculation. The first negative speaker opened our case by discussing these other measures, as well as presenting the way in which alexages provide a fabricated resilience, one in which dependence and resist, res, resistance arises. The second negative speaker further went on to analyse the cognitive impacts of alexogens and the way in which such will waste both time, money and resources. And ladies and gentlemen, even if we consider the opponent's definition, our points still stand. And in such way, inoculation is not the path forward. Using these drugs to inoculate against depression and trauma will only lead to further distress and further damage to human life. Thank you. While the adjudicators finalise the result, I will read this evening's chairman, no, the chairman's vote, please. So, the winners of today, all grand, all grand finalists, will be invited to the award presentations to be held on Thursday, 3rd November 2022 at 5pm to 6pm uh, at the Government House. Each team has been allocated nine places, and we need to collect names and contact details by this weekend. Please see the information desk to register your details or refer to the information sent to, the, uh, sent to team coaches earlier in the week. The grand finals will be held at Parliament House on Saturday, the 24th of September, 2022. Please refer to the debating essay website for times. So, year 10 and senior, would you like to be an adjudicator for primary school debates in 2023? Adjudicating is great community service and it will help to improve your own debating. See the information desk for more information about how to sign up. Just remember, you six people, we know where you live. You better, you, better, you better join to adjudicate next year, okay? I want to see those names somewhere. She's all tall. Oh, yeah? Yeah, try next. Thank you, I've got one. Thank you very much. Good job, guys. You guys did great. I'm going to put this in bed. Just wait. 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 So whatever the result is, you did well. Yeah.
I know. I now invite a representative of the adjudication panel to come forward and announce the results. Congrats on both of you teams for making it this far. You've done really, really well to get this far, and it, you guys put in an excellent amount of effort, especially only having one week to prepare for this. So you guys did a really good job. I want to make that really plain right off the bat. So congratulations to both of you. Um, but the, the, between the three of us, it was a unanimous decision uh, to give the win tonight to the negative team. So oh. congratulations. <laughs> and we also want to award the speaker of the night to the second negative, Jamie. Um, I now call upon a member of the runner-up team to give a vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Nasa College, for having a good event and congrats on the win and getting the grand final. Thank you for the adjudicator, no, thank you for the timekeeper and chairman for making this possible and helping in the debate. Thank you for all three adjudicators for adjudicating this debate. It wouldn't be possible without you guys. And thank you for my team for helping us prepare for the debate. And thank you, lastly, for not this for the parents I came in to watch it before. <laughs> um, I call upon a member of the winning team to get to second that vote of thanks. Uh, hi, I'd just like to say thank you for everybody for coming. It's been a great debate. Um, very fun season so far, and I've loved every minute of it. Thank you very much for the adjudicators for making this possible and for using your time here. Um, and thank you for tonight, of course. Thank you very much for the chairs, chairman and timekeeper. You guys were great at chairpersoning timekeeping. <laughs> thank you for the other opposition. You've given us a great debate and it's been very fun. Thank you very much for all the parents. It's been a wonderful time and we love your support. Thank you for Emily for finally showing up to one of these. Um, yeah, it's been a long time coming and you're finally here. Uh, thank you for my teammates for being amazing. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance. I now declare this debate closed.